25th anniversary lecture series. Uh, you'll see that the meeting is being live streamed. Uh, so please keep yourselves on mute at all times, unless you want to be forever immortalized in the worldwide cyberspace, uh, you and your comments that you may not be wanting to make. When you have questions, or if you have questions this evening, please enter them in the chat. And uh, after Dr. McKinney has spoken, there'll be an opportunity for our Dean, uh, Beth Bratslav, to pose a number of the questions that you have raised in a, in a kind of conversation with, with Jason. The Reverend Dr. Jason McKinney is a pastor, priest, and teacher in the Anglican Diocese of Toronto. He completed a PhD in religious studies at the University of Toronto in 2012 and was ordained to the priesthood in 2014. He's the incumbent of the parish of Epiphany and St. Mark in the Parkdale area of Toronto. And he serves as an adjunct professor of theology at Trinity College and is very much a theological educator. I believe it's fair to say that at the heart of his ministry, both pastoral and scholarly, the heart of his ministry is on the ground in real time communities. Jason is committed to the Anglican tradition of geographical parish ministry in the sense that the parish represents the entire neighborhood, the entire community, the entire community around the congregation, hence the notion of the church as commons or a wide neighborhood. He has said that it's important for people to see that we as a church are invested in connection and collaboration and peaceful coexistence. In our own way, we're pursuing the well being of our communities. Jason, we look forward to hearing your thoughts this evening on the church as commons, a theological case for affordable housing. Over to you, Jason. Thank you very much, Bishop Shane. Good evening to everybody. I am very pleased to be joining you on what I understand is a snowy evening in Ottawa, as it is here in Toronto. I'm, I'm joining you this, this, this evening from the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg and the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat, from the place that the Mohawk call Takaranto. Importantly, it's a territory subject to the dish with one spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, a covenant originally between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee, but later extended to the British crown and its successors. Parties to this covenant are obliged to share and care for the land around the Great Lakes. I bring you greetings from the Anglican Diocese of Toronto, and in particular from the people of Epiphany and St. Mark Parkdale. I wanted to take some time to thank Brian Cameron and the other organizers of this really great series of lectures and to say what a profound honor it is to follow in the footsteps of Michelle Good. I was able to watch her powerful inaugural lecture and only hope that what I have to offer this evening can amplify and contribute to her call for right relations between a settler church and the first peoples of this land. Also, I would like to thank David Humphreys and the Diocesan Homelessness and Affordable Housing Working Group for the invitation to speak to you this evening. It really is a pleasure to be with you because for many years now, I've considered the Diocese of Ottawa to be a beacon and an example within the Anglican Church of Canada of the way the church should be engaging with the pressing matters of affordable housing. In fact, I'm quite certain that I have more to learn from you than you do from me on this question. I have already learned a great deal from my many conversations with the Reverend Monique Stone and the exciting project that is happening at St. Julian of Norwich. More recently, I've been inspired by the Archdeacon Catherine Otley's story about the affordable housing project at Christ Church Bells Corners. And I know there are other projects as well. And finally, I'm grateful to Bishop Shane for his outward and forward-looking leadership. 
because there is a strong temptation in these times to turn both inward and backward. Inward to try to protect what we perceive to be our own interests as the church and backward with nostalgia for a time when we had more to protect, more wealth, more influence, more power. And so taking the occasion of the 125th anniversary of the diocese, where one would be forgiven for reveling in nostalgia, to take this occasion in order to look out beyond the walls of the church and out beyond the horizon of our present crisis is a project that I'm honored to participate in. So thank you very much. I would like to begin by telling you a story, but before we do that, I'd like to take a little bit of time to do some breathing together. We'll be spending the next hour or so very much in our minds, so it might be a good idea to attend also to our bodies. So I'd like to invite you, if you're comfortable, to take three deep breaths. Take your time on both the inhale and the exhale. As you inhale, notice your chest rising and your stomach tightening and your lungs expanding. As you exhale, notice the falling of the chest and the softening of the belly and the releasing of the breath. I'd also invite you to place your hands, palms up and fingers spread on your lap or on your table. This physical posture of openness will perhaps help us to let go of whatever it is that we're holding and allow the spirit some room to move. Take another breath or two. And I'll begin with a story. I do have a slide to go along with the story. So if you don't mind sharing that slide, Heidi, that would be great. Just one more forward, perfect. It was July, 2020 in Los Angeles, California. Amidst the heat of the summer, both high temperatures and high racial tensions, a local actress and stunt woman named Alex Marshall Brown sat down under the shade of a large elm tree on the lawn of St. Paul's First Lutheran Church in North Hollywood. She spread out a blanket, opened her laptop, and began planning a camping trip. It wasn't long before Marshall Brown, a young black woman, was approached by two older white men from the church. She began recording the encounter on her phone. Fumbling with a cordless drill, one of the men made a few attempts to affix a no trespassing sign to the elm tree that was graciously providing shade for its guest. They didn't speak to her. Instead, they directed all of their attention to the tree and to the task at hand. If we could advance to the next slide. So the young woman spoke first. Hello, she says. The man with a sign keeping his eyes on the tree replied, welcome. The dissonance between word and deed caused Marshall Brown to question his sincerity. Am I, she asks, to which he replies, nope. Why am I not welcome? Because this is private property. This church, this church is not welcoming me? No, it's not, he replied. We have a lot of problems with people vandalizing, and we don't want anyone on the private property. You want to stay on the sidewalk, that's okay. The mayor says you can have all the sidewalk you want but you can't be on the grass. That's our property. As the conversation continues, the two men, later joined by an older white woman, reply to Marshall Brown's questions about what exactly the problem is and how she is implicated. They try without much success to make the conversation about general problems of vandalism and safety instead of about race. When people aren't nice, says the man, finally managing to bore a screw through the sign and into the tree, we're not nice. When the black woman asked how she had been unkind, the man replies, you haven't, 
but we have to treat everybody the same. All lives matter. Keep in mind, this is the summer of 2020. Not only is the world on edge, deep in the throes of a new deadly pandemic, but the fires of a global anti-racist uprising, ignited by the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others, are raging. In this context, all lives matter is not an innocent, empirical, certainly not a theological claim. It is a racist trope meant to undermine the, the titular claim of the growing Black Lives Matter movement. The conversation continued for several more minutes, but the outcome will probably not be a surprise. This stranger's expulsion from the small patch of church land was all but inevitable. Whatever else they spoke of, vandalism, safety, city bylaws, what is clear is that the church representatives wanted this black woman off of their property. And they were willing to use the informal and legal powers afforded to them as property owners in order to do it. The only real uncertainty was how the violence of the state would come into play because property and police go hand in hand. The church had in fact called the police preemptively before ever speaking to the woman. But fortunately, in this case anyway, it did not result in the injury or death of yet another black woman. Alex Marshall Brown went on her way and the possessive grip of property was not relinquished. Neither the grip that St. Paul's First Lutheran Church held over its property, nor notably the grip that property held over the church. And we can stop the screen share for a little while. Now I relate this story not to shame any individual or to call out any congregation in particular, I can empathize with the frustration and the weariness of these custodians of church property. I know firsthand how difficult it is to maintain an increasingly costly church building amidst rapidly decreasing revenues and diminishing volunteer support. I can understand how they may have perceived their effort to protect, that's their word, their beloved church as innocent or even virtuous. The law, after all, was on their side. I tell this story because it is symptomatic. It is symptomatic not just of the reality of church decline, not just of the long history of white people telling black people where they do and do not belong, and not just of the decay of the Christian practice of hospitality, and not just the failure to think critically and theologically about land, but also of a certain enthrallment Enthrallment of the church to the power of property. An unyielding possessiveness in the way that churches relate to land. This evening, I want to suggest that there are two basic paradigms available to churches. Two ways of conceiving of our relationship to land, which then conditions what we do or don't do with that land. The first I call the property paradigm. St. Paul's First Lutheran is one, but certainly not the only example of how churches remain entangled in this paradigm. The second I call the commons paradigm. And if we can have the screen share back up in the next slide, I'm gonna sketch in a very condensed way the meaning of these two paradigms before elaborating on each and then offering what I see to be some of the implications and possibilities of a shift from a property to a commons paradigm. When it comes to the property paradigm, the watchword is dominion. Its primary function is exclusion and the spiritual posture that it requires and encourages is one of having. The 18th century English jurist William Blackstone famously described property as, quote, 
that sole and despotic dominion, which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in the total exclusion of the right of any other individual in the universe. The watchword of the commons paradigm, on the other hand, is relation. Its primary function is sharing, and the spiritual posture that it requires and encourages is one of holding. Unlike the sole despotic dominion of the property owner, the commoner is constantly relating, constantly negotiating with the land and with other people around questions of access, of use, of benefit, of care, and responsibility. My focus tonight will be primarily on those spiritual postures, having and holding, that are cultivated through the practices of ownership on the one hand and sharing on the other. We could see the next slide. To have is to grasp and possess a thing in Blackstone's telling language, a thing like land which is perceived to be inert and mappable and exchangeable. To hold is to keep, to tend, and to care within a network of reciprocal relations and obligations. Borrowing a formulation from scholar of race and religion, J. Cameron Carter, I believe we have become a church of having without holding when what we are being called to be is a church that has learned to hold without having. Land, I suggest, should be held, not had. And we can stop the screen share again. I'm gonna say more about this, but I need to specify geographically and historically and culturally that the churches I'm referring to in this talk, including St. Paul's First Lutheran Church and our own Anglican Church, are the ones that Alan Roxborough has called the Euro-tribal churches. That is those churches that trace to the great migrations from the United Kingdom and Europe over the past four to 500 years, the churches that form the primary Christian groups in the United States and Canada. My interest in this subset of the global Christian church is related to but distinct from Roxborough's focus on what he calls the great unraveling. That is the decline and the general loss of political and cultural power that these churches had in a previous era. The unraveling that Roxborough refers to has been the occasion for many land-rich denominations and congregations to reassess their property portfolios. The acceleration of this unraveling due to the COVID-19 pandemic has caused even more churches to undertake such a reassessment. In some cases, this has been a good thing. Congregations have recognized underutilized assets and loosened their grasp on those assets. And more church land has been freed up for the common good. But this moment also carries a risk. The risk that decline will cause some churches not to loosen, but to tighten their grasp on land because land, real property, as we like to call it, represents one of our last remaining financial certainties. Some churches will be tempted to leverage this certainty in the interest of institutional survival. But then the question needs to be asked, what is the value of institutional survival when it comes at the expense of spiritual decline? And this question about land is a spiritual question. Euro tribal churches are beginning to learn this from our indigenous siblings, but it's there in the Western tradition as well. The matter goes deeper than questions of asset management. It is about a coming to terms with the colonial, racial and violent history of land acquisition and distribution that belongs to Euro tribal churches and to settler society more generally. It is a reckoning with our past in order to reimagine our future. 
An important element of this spiritual work will be what the Christian tradition has variously called surrender, detachment, dispossession, or simply a spiritual practice of letting go. Letting go of the property paradigm. Letting go of our having land in order to learn how to hold it. Letting go of the property paradigm. We in the Western tradition have been so completely habituated, formed and catechized even by the property paradigm that it's hard to see anything outside of it. But for the sake of the church, for the sake of our neighborhoods, for the sake of right relations with indigenous people, indeed for the sake of the planet, we need to recognize that the land is not ours to have, only to hold. Now you may have cringed like I did to hear it put so bluntly. This is private property. You may have wished as I did that St. Paul's First Lutheran Church had chosen the higher path of hospitality to the racialized stranger in their midst. But it was not an untrue statement. St. Paul's First Lutheran Church is private property. All the churches in the Diocese of Ottawa are, legally speaking, private property, governed by the common law and by the Ontario Land Titles Act. All land, all real property, is either privately or publicly held as property. And this is not just our legal reality either. It's also our everyday way of talking about land. It's also the language we find in our church canons and committees. In what congregation doesn't have a property committee? So when I identify property as a paradigm, or more importantly, when I argue that we should train ourselves out of this paradigm, I'm not arguing a legal point. The letter of the law is clear, or as clear as property law can be. So short of arguing for the abolition of private property, which I'm not doing tonight, we are dealing with a question of spiritual formation, how to live well with land, with others, and with God, even within private property regimes. But as Christians, as readers of St. Paul in particular, attention like this should not be new. Legality was never a principle of the highest good for Paul. Instead, it was always a provisional instrument of peaceable existence, a technology of relationship. But whenever legality prevented the Christian person from living out the fullness of their calling, as for instance, Paul saw in the requirement for Gentile believers to be circumcised, then such laws were disclaimed. Circumcision is nothing, he says in 1 Corinthians, and uncircumcision is nothing. But obeying the commandments of God is everything. Paul was not interested in rewriting Roman or Jewish law so that it would be more inclusive of Christian practice. Instead, he argued that Christians are simply free, discharged from those aspects of the law which contravened or inhibited the gospel. The principle is most succinctly captured in the apostles' claim in 1 Corinthians 6, that, quote, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. What might it mean to take such an approach to private property laws as they apply to church lands. We may be within our rights to quote unquote protect our churches from those whom we see as dangerous or as other. We are not legally obliged to be responsive to the needs of our communities. It may be a smart financial move to hold on to vacant or underutilized lands even amidst an affordable housing crisis. 
It may be an even smarter move to sell such land to luxury housing developers. But just because it is lawful does not mean that it is beneficial. Just because it is lawful does not mean that it should have dominion over us. If we are going to resist the dominion of the property paradigm, resist both the dominion it authorizes us to exercise over others and the dominion it exercises over us, then we will need a set of practices that can train us out of the possessiveness that such church laws awaken, such laws, pardon me, awaken within us. Personal and collective spiritual practices of letting go. The spiritual practices would be both personal and collective. There are many examples within the Christian tradition of personal spiritual practices intended to cultivate a non-possessive attitude. The little breathing exercises we did at the start of the talk, it was a mini practice in this direction. These teachings and practices encourage a posture of what I'm calling holding without having. Many of these teachings and practices trace their roots back to Jesus himself who in the words of the ancient Christological hymn of Philippians 2, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself. Much of this teaching is preserved in the monastic or the so-called mystical strands of the Christian tradition. This does not imply that the insights are peripheral to the core theological claims of the tradition, it just means that we will often need to look to the mystics and the monastics for lived examples of a spirituality that has radically turned from possessiveness to generosity or from having to holding. And if we could get the screen share once again. Former Archbishop of Canterbury, Roland Williams, calls this a posture of dispossession. And he describes its basic contours in this way. As we learn to let go of our fierce impulse to contain and control, we become more patient with the fact that we are in the process not of mastering an object, but of orienting ourselves in a territory. And in the course of this, we are being changed, prized away from our centeredness in ourselves and our own safety or profit and redirected towards the strangeness both of God and of the finite other, the neighbor. It is precisely this prizing away from our centeredness in ourselves and our own safety or profit that is required for us personally and collectively if we are to free ourselves from the dominion of the property paradigm and to contribute to the flourishing of our local communities. We can stop the screen share again for the remainder. In the history of the church, it has been the Franciscans through their vow of poverty who have most vigorously and explicitly refused the dominion of property in favor of a non-proprietary and shared use of land. Their common life was in many ways a translation of the personal posture of holding without having into a collective spiritual practice and form of life. It is probably unrealistic to expect Euro tribal churches on the whole to adopt this Franciscan radicalism. But in the interest of deeper faithfulness, of the church's public witness, and of more diverse and affordable neighborhoods, we do need to cultivate our own collective spiritual practices of sharing. That is, we need to cultivate commoning practices. I believe we need to become a commoning church. What do I mean by that? A commons, simply put, is a shared asset. 
if the property paradigm is so pervasive that we have trouble imagining anything outside of it, the commons paradigm presents the opposite problem. It's hard to picture where such a reality might exist within capitalist property regimes. But that's because commons does not necessarily describe a place or a legal regime, which does not mean it is a mere utopia either. It is a practical and spiritual posture that one takes toward land or other forms of property. Historian Peter Leinbau suggests that it might be better to keep the word as a verb, an activity, rather than as a noun, a substantive. In other words, it may be better to speak of commoning rather than to speak of the commons. In fact, we really only ever encounter a commons in process as a social and spiritual practice. Picking up on this idea, economic geographers J.K. Gibson Graham defined commoning as, quote, a relational process of negotiating access, use, benefit, care, and responsibility. So the commons paradigm that I'm opposing to the property paradigm is not first of all a place, but a practice. It is precisely the problem with the property paradigm that it has reduced land to paper, to a commodity. It is too settled, too closed, too fortified. It excludes meaningful connection to land, to neighbor, to God. To speak of commoning rather than the commons also frees us from that binary or zero sum thinking about property the kind that can be so polarizing. It's either private property or public property. It's either capitalism or communism. It's either the sacralization of private property or its complete abolition. Commoning, on the other hand, does not need to deal in these abstractions or wait for a revolution. As Gibson Graham remind us, Commoning can take place with any form of property, from privately owned property to open access property. So this means that even church lands, lands that according to the common law and the Ontario Land Titles Act are private property, such lands can be commoned. They can be released for the good of our communities. They can provide accessible community space in a time when such spaces are harder and harder to find. They can become community hubs where small ecosystems of value aligned partners co-locate and increase local impact. And as the Diocese of Ottawa is aware, they can become sites of stable and affordable housing. And let's not forget the other side of commoning as well. Commoning is a relationship not only about giving, but also about receiving. Commoning churches can receive the care of the community, even if they're not sitting in our pews. Commoning churches can receive the wisdom of other religious traditions. Commoning churches can receive, let's get very practical for a minute, public funds to help with our commoning efforts. I know the Diocese of Ottawa knows about this as well. So to become a commoning church means to have lived more deeply into the dispossessive or canonic spiritual practices of the Christian tradition, not only personally, but collectively. It means to have entered more fully into the relational networks and local ecosystems of our neighborhoods where the decisions we make about land are not decisions based only on our own interests, but in the interest of the whole community. And here I move towards a conclusion. You may have noticed that my approach in this talk has not been to marshal all the teachings in the history of the church that favor what Catholic social thought calls the common destination of created goods. 
if I had wanted to mount a theological attack on wealth accumulation and private property, I could have pulled together a pretty impressive team, starting with a creator whose creation was given as a common gift, a Messiah whose counsel to a rich man was to sell all he had and give the proceeds to the poor. An early church whom the Spirit led to share all of their possessions in common. I could have continued with the early church fathers, especially Chrysostom and Ambrose, whose sermons sharply condemned the private appropriation of what God had clearly intended for the common good. I could have focused on the monastic practices of poverty, like the Franciscan radicalism I already referred to. I could have then included the religiously motivated resistances to the English enclosures, the abolitionist movement's realization that the problem with slavery was not just that people could become enslaved, but that people could become property. And the civil rights movement, as it realized that black freedom also meant wealth redistribution. Or contemporary liberationist, decolonial, and indigenous theologies, all of which challenge Euro tribal churches to reckon with its colonial past and the central role that land has always played. The problem with this approach is that someone else could just come along and make an equally compelling case in favor of the private appropriation of creation, even if there was agreement that creation was originally given as a common gift. The truth is that there is no definitive Christian teaching on private property. Or more accurately, there are several definitive Christian teachings on private property. To put this to you as an intellectual contest would have been to cheapen the importance of the question by reducing it to a choice that you could make based on your preference or your predisposition. But the stakes are too high for that. We have an affordable housing crisis, which is also a humanitarian crisis. The recent cold snap here in Toronto has revealed once again that to be unhoused is not just to be underprivileged, but to be constantly exposed to the risk of death. We cannot afford to do nothing. In particular, land-owning churches cannot afford to do nothing. The fourth century Bishop of Milan, St. Ambrose, who I referred to a moment ago, in a sermon that he gave on the story of Naboth's vineyard from 1 Kings 21, pointed out to his rich parishioners that whatever surplus wealth they retained after their basic needs were met was not a discretionary excess, but a debt that was owed to those whose basic needs had not been met. For the earth, he says, belongs to everyone, not to the rich. Despite all that we are losing in the great unraveling of our Euro tribal churches, we still tend to be rich in land. We tend to have more land than we know what to do with. Unquestionably, our basic needs are met, especially as our congregations shrink. But still, we treat our surplus lands as an asset management question, as a financial investment, as insurance for the future. But if Ambrose is correct, then what we really have on our hands is a problem. We are hoarding an inequitable share of the earth, an earth that was created by a generous God and given to the whole of creation as a common gift. I've tried to make the case that Euro tribal churches remain entangled in a property paradigm. We relate to land as a thing, an inert, mappable, and exchangeable territory that is ours to own, to police, to monetize at will. We imagine, in short, that land is ours to have. Having is a spiritual posture of possessiveness that has been cultivated through generations of colonial and racial practice, 
and is constantly reinforced through our participation in capitalist land regimes. This way of relating to land puts us at odds, not only with indigenous ways of being with land, but also with an important strand within the Christian tradition. This canonic tradition as both a personal practice of dispossession and a collective practice of commoning encourages a different spiritual posture, not having, but holding. To lean into this posture of holding without having will not only help to shape us into the kind of people that resemble the self-emptying Messiah we follow, but better neighbors, better caretakers and keepers of the gift of creation. Our approach to our current affordable housing crisis and the role of the church within the crisis as a spiritual problem may seem an odd route to take. But I believe this approach offers something unique and important. So I'd like to conclude by naming two reasons why. It is practical and it is prefigurative. First, this approach gives us a practical way to respond to the crisis. It is practical because we can begin right where we are. Some of us might be, in fact, I know that some of us are in a position to begin by redeveloping a piece of church land into an affordable housing project. Julian of Norwich, Christ Church Bells Corners, some of us probably should do just that, start envisioning at the local level, start approving and supporting at the diocesan level. Let's get that affordable housing built. But even if you're not in a position to get a shovel in the ground, you can still begin by breathing, just like we did at the beginning of the talk. Start breathing your way one intentional breath at a time into the dispossessive spirituality of Jesus. A spirituality which, as Rowan Williams noted, redirects us towards the strangeness both of God and of the finite other, the neighbor. From there, you might begin to study. Study the teachings of the Christian tradition on surrender, on detachment, letting go. And from there, you might join with others in this breathing, praying, and studying. And if you do lean into these teachings and practices, if you let go and leave room for the spirit, I think you will find yourself caught up in the same commoning wind that swept through the early church, causing them to share all things in common. You will have learned to hold without having. And if you can bring that spirituality with you into your synods, your annual vestries and AGMs, your corporation meetings, your neighborhood councils, community consultations and development approval meetings, I believe the commoning spirit will fill those spaces as well. Because the wind of the spirit blows where it pleases, within and beyond our churches. To focus on the cultivation of spiritual postures is practical, but it is also prefigurative, by which I mean it refuses the subordination of means to ends. As I mentioned, commoning does not need to await a revolution or the abolition of private property. Any property can be commoned. By engaging in practices of commoning, we are also reflecting an image of the kind of world that we want to live in. The work is not just about building units. It's also about affordable, inclusive communities that thrive in networks of sharing and conviviality. The goal of urban community land trusts like the one in my neighborhood of Parkdale is to secure land to decommodify it by removing it from the speculative market and preserve it for community use. So although it must participate to some degree in capitalist land regimes, 
The goal is not just units, it's community. The democratic structure of the organization is a reflection of the kind of community it is trying to build for the future. We in the church are already trained in this prefigurative thinking. Our understanding of church is not instrumental. The church is not a means to the reign of God. It is a prefiguration, a foretaste of God's reign. And it can only be called the church to the extent that it is such a visible and material manifestation of God's reign. When so many neighbors lack adequate housing, what better way can there be to manifest that reign than to release the land and the wealth that we are storing up? Storing up where not only moth and rust destroy, but also deferred maintenance and poor stewardship. Neither our vain hopes for a return to a former glory nor our speculations about land values justifies our inequitable share of the earth. And so we should share out of the excess that we have. For not only could such sharing be a foretaste of God's reign, but it was never really ours to have in the first place, only to hold. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. I'm going to give you a moment to take those proverbial three breaths <laughs> and to lift your hands up after that um, very, very substantial and thoughtful lecture. In the meantime, our Dean will uh, assemble some of the questions that have been coming in. And if everyone else wants to simply stand up and turn around and sit down, that's probably a good idea at this point as well. We all know the, the Zoom, uh, the demand of Zoom on our, on our bodies and our minds, however enriching the content is. So Dean Beth, when you're ready, please signal and uh, you can begin. Jason, you're okay to go? Good man. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jason. So for everyone, if you could just write your questions in the chat, that would be great. I'm, I, I need a few more questions. So while we're addressing some of these, perhaps you can uh, add some more. Jason, um, I just want to, one of the first questions that came in, in fact, was um, something about how, like it's a long way from learning to breathe together um, to providing affordable housing. Um, do you have any sort of practical little steps along the way that might be helpful uh, for us to either to practice or to also uh, pay attention to so that by the time you're moving, you know that you're actually moving in that direction? It's a good question. I mean, I, I tried to spell it a bit of a step-by-step -step of how, mm -hmm. how we get from, from that point to the building of affordable housing. I know that's obviously not a, a roadmap, um, but I think for, it, it, it comes out of a, a personal experience. So I discovered at almost the same time, the, the depth of the con Christian contemplative tradition and the capacity of a neighborhood to to create a commons or to, to engage in commoning activities together. Um, they didn't happen together. They were sort of separate. It was the, the commoning was happening outside of the church. The, the contemplative practice was happening with my colleague who's on the call now um, within the church. But for me, they were very obviously connected. And so almost since that time, I've been trying to build that bridge. <laughs> and so this was sort of one attempt to, to sort of throw something across the chasm um, for my own sake as, as much as, as, as for the church's sake. But I, I just, there's something that just doesn't make sense to me in, in one respect, where why do we, why do we stop that, that 
that deep work of dispossession, why does that stop at the property line? And I know that's not an obvious, there's no obvious answer to that question. I'm sitting in a home that I own right now. So I, it's, but there's, there's something about that, that threshold that is, it feels in, inviolable. And I, I could say one more thing, but maybe I should take a couple more. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, I think sort of a, it's kind of a follow up on that, but someone is asking, you know, how can we hold on to exactly what you're talking about, that holy sense of our space, our holy space that we, our sacred space that nurtures and, you know, does all the things that it does uh, for the community of the church, um, but also hold it wide open. Do you see what I mean? How do you, do you have any I sort of bridging? How do you bridge those two things? How do you approach your property um, that you're trying to be holy and find some, some sacredness in and then take it out and not lose it all, um, so to speak, lose perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is the question for, for bishops and people in, in synod offices to figure out in terms of the portfolio. Right. So mm -hmm. some some churches aren't going to make it. And yet that land is going to continue to be held by that diocese. So maybe there's a, a good decision to be made about the future of that land, even if it doesn't continue to be a worshiping congregation. Maybe it's it's a, a spiritual covenant that uh, that happens with an indigenous community so that when you see sort of down the road that that, that a, a congregation isn't going to last forever that there's a covenant that you enter into ahead of time where when that does, when that time does come, there's a way of transferring that land to um, that indigenous community. And I know this is something, an idea that has come out of uh, the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations and this, mm -hmm. uh, this attempt to try to build relationships with churches um, that move us towards reconciliation and that take seriously the question of land. But th there will be, those congregations that continue to be thriving congregations. So it's it's not dispossession doesn't have to be an either or. It I think there can be, and I think this is the case again with the two cases that I'm aware of in your diocese, that you do have thriving congregations in in both situations, which are helping to make the project work. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes, and so maybe Catherine or Monique could maybe speak to this better than I could. How do you negotiate that? releasing of, of, of some of the land to the community for affordable housing and continue to keep um, a space for, for Christian worship and formation. Right. Right. I think it's more a sort of the, um, uh, the thinking of in our mind space, how do we hold that? You know, both of those at the same time sometimes is, is a trick. And what do you, what is your opinion on sort of how do we, hold land is it all right do you think to hold land to generate income to support parishes and communities for instance developing for market housing or partnering with perhaps a coffee shop or a grocery store in the local community rather than do housing because not everywhere is suited to housing um, what do you think about that idea yeah i mean i it's it's not for me to say without being attentive to each context, what makes sense and what doesn't. I think there's probably a way to develop some principles so that that good decisions can be made. Mm -hmm. But yeah, definitely there, there's not, it, it's not a matter of replicating the same model at, at every site. I do have a preference <laughs> for affordable non-market housing, working with not-for-profit developers, all of these things as much as that's possible, I would always choose that option personally. Mm -hmm. But um, it's it's also sort of the, the congregation I work in, which is that also in the neighborhood that I live in, and I'm aware of the kind of neighborhood that that is. All of that is actually very possible. It actually does make a lot of sense to work with a not-for-profit developer and to focus primarily on um, affordable housing. Um, but again, I think I think context and deep attention to that context um, is really the best way to make those kind of decisions. Do you have any ideas about um, how you would actually discern that um, around what to do with 
property in different contexts? Because that is a huge question, obviously. Well, I think that that the, the, the work of commenting is really important, whatever that the redevelopment of the development looks like. Mm -hmm. And so I think commenting is, a, is really about getting to know your neighborhood and your neighbors. And that's probably the best way, at least the place to start for thinking about what you want to do in that place. So, I mean, this is almost pro forma, the way that a developer would do it or a good developer anyway <laughs> would would start with community consultations to see if what 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 they have in their head is actually a good fit for the place that they would like to build it great and do you know of any examples of churches who have created land trusts for green space where nobody lives but there's a people can enjoy the space um, sort of like your the beginning story that you started out with the, with the gal under the tree um, mm -hmm. in the sense that it's not necessarily housing but it's it's something that's important in the community and in some places we don't have much green space have you heard of that idea yeah i i don't know very many specific examples except the one that I mentioned, the Parkdale Land Trust. Actually, the, the first acquisition of the Park, Parkdale Land Trust was not housing, but a, a, a green space or a brown space that was going to become a green space. Actually, right in the backyard of, of the, the congregation where I am, um, which is it's called the Milky Way Garden. Um, but it there's still a preference for housing with, with the Parkdale Land Trust. It just the way that things fell into place, that land became available. That land was not going to be serviced by the city. So there were some limitations. So there was that contextual discernment led to that point. But I know such trusts do exist. Um, I'm just more familiar with, with urban land trusts that focus on housing. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, what Can you tell us just a bit about your own situation, about Parkdale, what, what's happening there? What's, what all is part of that, um, that commenting that you're doing? I mean, the, the commenting efforts in Parkdale are in many ways have emerged as a response to the pressures that we're building from gentrification. So the, 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 the force of, of wealth and demographic change in this West End downtown neighborhood, uh, if they were just left to do what they were going to do, the neighborhood would look very different than it does now. It already looks very different than it did 10 years ago, but it would look completely different if it wasn't for a kind of a grassroots response where the approach was not that neighborhoods must stay the same forever, but okay, like developers will tell you change is inevitable, but if change is inevitable, then that change is gonna be determined at least in part by the people who are here right now. And so that's, that's where a, a lot of the, the vision behind the efforts that emerged in Parkdale in response to those pressures and threats of displace, displacement came from. Um, yeah, and so the Parkdale Land Trust was one of the things that, that came out of that. But it was also, personally, it was for an opportunity for me as, as a part of the church to engage and to try to, again, build that, that bridge between um, spiritual practice and, you know, local commitment to sharing. Was there a resistance uh, in your parish in terms of that? In, well, quite large cultural change, actually, a, sh a real shift. And if there was, how did you uh, address it? My experience with Epiphany and St. Mark has been that there's been a real openness to, I mean, the, the, the shift that happened for us was really one of moving from a parish who was sustained partly by uh, congregational givings and partly by rental income from tenants who may or may not have any connection to who we are, our self-understanding, to we have, we have surplus space. Why don't we focus on value-aligned partners, move away from the tenant-landlord relationship as the primary way of relating, and think about supporting local organizations that, whose vision we also support? 
So and that has turned out to be a very good choice for us in lots of different ways, including financially. Um, but it just it it feels more integrated, and it also helps a church an, an aging congregation that's not as active as it used to be to say, well, at least our building <laughs> is is having an impact, even if if we are not doing the same things that we used to do. Right. So give them a positive, uh, common focus, and away mm -hmm. you go. Good. Um, one of the first steps of commoning, uh, certainly at a parish level, seems to be having a strong theology of hospitality or developing such a hospital, uh, a ministry. Um, can you speak a bit about that, about the different, uh, the connection between hospitality and commoning? Yeah. Was that Mary Jo's question? No, um, it wasn't. It was somebody <laughs> else's question. <laughs> so this this is actually something I've been wanting to to think a little bit more about. But I th I think that commoning is almost like an intensification of hospitality. Hospitality is is sort of generally it it, it takes place at the threshold. It's sort of I will invite you in to my space to my property. Um, but hospitality at the threshold always opens on to a potential process of transformation. So it, hospitality, even the, the terms for, for host and guest in the, in the Latin, it's been a while, I hope I have that right, are basically the same term. So there's this exchangeability of, of host and guest. And I think if we actually move deeply into that practice of hospitality, we do start to those those boundaries start to to become fuzzy, and soon enough, we imagine that we, as you know, the sovereign of the of the space that we invite people into, soon become the guest. And I think commoning is, in some ways, a way of just saying yes, that's what happens, and that's what we want to happen, and let's see how far we can go with this. Great. Um, someone's asking about uh, that they really appreciate the paradigm of holding and it's a great way of focusing attention and land use. What are your thoughts on partway positions um, such as the church using space uh, being made um, by inviting the use to general public such as benches or gardens or concerts or other things? I mean, is that a step in the right direction? Is that, or do we, do you find that we get paused there for too long? I think if, if we're beginning with that, that personal spiritual transformation where this, that this non-proprietary sense where we're not threatened by people coming into our space, then wherever you start, I think is a good thing. And I think you also, it's also, and again, speaking from experience, it's also a, a capacity question, right? So you can be as welcoming, hospitable, engage in commenting only to the extent that you can sustain it. And sometimes maybe a, a bench on the front lawn of the church, maybe that's all you can do at this point. Right. Uh, so I think any step is a good step as long as it's that is a part of that process of, of, of letting go that we're doing personally, which I think then can sort of radiate and become a collective practice. Right. Um, since affordable housing requires a lot of extensive involvement by many, many different actors in that, um, do you see a role for uh, the church uh, trying to influence government or private developers uh, to promote um, affordable housing. How, what do you see as the role of the church in that? But, I mean, I get the, the practical commoning uh, thing in terms of our individual and our parishes, but what about the, the next level? Level. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all for advocacy, um, but I think it needs to be done, especially for land-rich churches, if that advocacy for affordable housing in your city is theoretical and you're not, you don't have skin in the game, then that's going to be a less meaningful type 
of advocacy. Um, so I'm, I think policy does need to be affected. I think I'm not opposed at all to, to that happening, but in, in some ways the, the church just has less influence than it used to, <laughs> to have the church advocating for whatever it is they're advocating for, it's, it, it still can have some impact, but it's not quite the, the force that it used to have. So it, it's sort of like things have switched where we have we have more to offer actually in terms of, of, of material toward these inclusive, affordable communities um, than we do, you know, power to influence politicians to implement policy that's gonna, so it's a both and, but I just think we have to recognize the moment that we're in as a church. And I think we're gonna have more impact with skin and or land in the game rather than just advocacy. Yes, I think you're probably very, very right about that. Um, and one person was just wanting to clarify, um, should church, do you think the church, need, it's a better thing for the church to just simply divest sometimes of the land um, or even to buy more land perhaps in some cases, because sometimes we don't have the land in the right places, as you notice, we have a lot of churches, um, but they're not necessarily in the geographical locations that may be most helpful right now for affordable housing or for anything else, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and so what do you uh, think about that? Yeah, I, I, I pray, again, I'm not a bishop, so I don't really have to think too deeply about these things, but my sense is that we need to have within our approach to the property portfolio, um, land transfer, I think in particular to indigenous communities. I think that, I, I don't think that's something that we need to implement across the board, but if it's not something that's that's that we seriously consider for situations where it makes sense, then I think we're not we're not doing all that we can. So I, I think so transfer or giving away of land, I think should be one of the tools in, in the toolbox. Um, again, especially as it has to do with um, moving towards reconciliation with indigenous communities. And if, if a church is in a position where they can purchase land, especially if that land is at risk of um, being lost to a community, I think better for a church, better for a, a, a charity to, to be able to, to, to grab that piece of land than for it to be sold to a luxury developer and that community to become more and more um, exclusive. Right, great. Um, and here's a quite practical question um, that our breathing exercise at the beginning were a good example of the physical practice of letting go, which we all know it, if you only hear about it, you're not going to do anything about it. It's got to be part of, of your whole being. Um, do you have any recommendations for Lenten practices? I can think this must be a clergy person thinking forward to their mm. Lenten, uh, Lenten studies going on. Uh, do you have any ideas for uh, Lenten practices to help us let go that you might have used in your toolbox at some point. I mean, there. I mean, it's it's always worth I think experimenting with the richness of the contemplative tr traditions within the church. So mm -hmm. centering prayer is is a really good one, and there's lots of resources out there for um, sort of gradually moving into that practice, which is very much a practice of of letting go. I think it may be interesting to somehow tie that to the, the a collective practice of, of letting go or, or commenting. It's, again, these are the sort of the two pieces of, of, of the talk, but I haven't really thought too much about how to tie those together in terms of a, a Lenten curriculum, but it's a really good question. And I'd love to use something that somebody puts together <laughs> or take some time <laughs> and think more about that. Don't expect you to have all this figured out. It's uh, <laughs> the work in progress for all of us. Is there anything, Jason, that you want to add to what, I mean, you've sort of got the, these are the questions. I think I'm, I'm out of questions at the moment. If anyone has any more, that'd be great. But anything else with the nature of the questions that we've been asking that you might want to add at all at this point? 
I think that maybe the one other thing that I wanted to incorporate into the talk, but it didn't really work. Um, but there's something I, I mentioned the the difficulty or how that that the property line becomes this inviolable mm -hmm. threshold that we don't cross with our spirituality of letting go. And I think that that's probably true for most, if not all of us. But the church puts a little bit of distance between us in our sense um, of, of ownership or, or proprietary way of relating to it. And so I think it, the church gives us a, a, a sort of a, a training ground for becoming um, commoners mm. because of that. So there's, there's a risk in, in property thinking in general, um, but for the church as well, to, to think about the church as a version of the way that we think about our home. Mm. And I think that's, that's where the that's where the possessiveness sort of comes into play. But because we don't actually relate to the church the way we do to our homes, it's, it's a good place where we can learn to let go, which then potentially we can bring back to our homes <laughs> and be able to, to come on our, our homes a little bit more if we've, if we've done a bit of that practice with the church. So that, it's, it's an unfinished thought, but it's, it seems to me another one of those places where the church has something to offer in this larger vision of, of seeing a, a, a world with more commoning happening. Right, that's, that's really interesting, that sort of spiral that connects um, the church, our homes, et cetera. So that's mm -hmm. great. Thank you, Jason, very much for answering all those questions that we had for you. It's great. They were great questions. Thank you for fielding those. You're welcome. Thank you, Dean Beth. I would now invite Archdeacon Catherine Otley to express our thanks to Dr. McKinney. Catherine. Thank you, Jason. Dr. McKinney, we are honored to learn from your contribution to our 125th celebration as we both reckon with our past and reimagine our future in this time of, as you mentioned, the great unraveling. It's important when we consider affordable housing that we have a strong foundation, a good bedrock to build on and from. And you have called us this evening to resist that property paradigm that we are just, that is embedded within us and to reorient ourselves to dispossession, to letting go and challenging ourselves to um, develop those spiritual practices you mentioned that help us embrace holding rather than having it spoke to me of of having a respect of the land um, that we are caring for and a respect therefore for our neighbors so thank you for helping us to become true community and learn how to practice commoning thank you for your words this evening it was very much my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And and Diocese of Ottawa, keep up the good work on affordable housing. We we all have a lot to learn from you. Thank you for those encouraging words, Jason. They're much appreciated. And your reference to uh, bishops and other people who work in synod offices were well taken. In, in all seriousness, well taken. You are a very thoughtful, thoughtful person, and we've appreciated your thoughts this evening. Thank you so much. Very much Thank pleasure. you all for participating tonight, those of you who are on the screen and those of you in YouTube land. Uh, this, this lecture will be held on our website for some time, so please encourage other people to uh, watch it. I certainly have some people in mind that I'm going to encourage, uh, encourage them to have a look at it. Our next lecture in this 125th anniversary lecture series is on Monday, February 21st at 7.30 p.m. And at that time, we'll be listening to a panel discussion uh, of environmental specialists and experts on the theme, Signs of Hope in the Fight Against Climate Change. There will be more information on that coming out very soon. As Jason began his talk this evening, um, a conversation I had with my Algonquin spiritual advisor, Albert Dumont, came to mind. And he told me that the territory on which the Diocese of Ottawa rests was before European contact entirely Algonquin Anishinaabe land. 
It was only after European contact that the Europeans awarded land that they had conquered to other indigenous nations. So that's something that uh, is very much in my mind as we think about land acknowledgement, the kind of um, Euro tribal interference in the land traditionally held by indigenous people. That's something we need to perhaps correct for or at least acknowledge when we acknowledge territory. And so I speak to you this night on the ancient territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. I wish you all a peaceful night. For those of you who are in conditions that are very snowy, a safe night. And may God's peace, which passes all understanding, be with you and those you love this day and always. Good night now, everyone. <laughs>